Looks like there are still some attendees joining, so we'll give another minute before we start. All right, I think we'll get started now. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to Free Thinks Rapid Formulation Development webinar. Uh, this is the first in a series of four different webinars. Um, the today's will be on target product profiles. Um, we'll have another one on solubilization selection, then followed by a third one on formulation for stability, and then lastly, the oral controlled release formulation. So there'll be four different presentations. Um, I'm Jennifer Chu, and I'll be moderating all four of the webinars. Um, just a bit about FreeThink. Um, we are a leading, leading laboratory for solving complex stability and formulation challenges using world-class science's speed products to market. Um, our mission is to use world-class science to speed better products to market. Um, we do that through um, our ASAP Prime stability software, which many folks are familiar with. Um, do that through some shelf life determination, packaging, um, and some of what we'll touch on today, which is ADAP formulation development. Um, and if you want to contact us, um, this is our contact information. We're on LinkedIn um, and certainly on the on our website and phone number there. Um, so moving on to today's presentation, um, today we'll be talking about target, target product profiles. Um, Jessica Kelly from FreeThink will be our presenter. Uh, Jessica received her BE in chemical engineering from Stony Brook University, specializing in polymer engineering. Through prior industry work, she gained expertise in the development of hydrogel and emulsion-based controlled release formulations. Since joining FreeThink Technologies in 2019, she has worked on developing diverse solid and liquid dosage formulations and has been an integral member of FreeThink's proprietary osmo -cap, osmotic capsule technology. Um, as a senior formulation engineer, she leads the development of formulations for customers. So I will pause, stop sharing, and turn it over to Jessica. Great. Let me share my screen. All right. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Jennifer. And so good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're not based in the US. So thank you for tuning in today. So as you can see, today's topic for discussion is target product profiles. So let's jump right in. So what I hope you'll walk away with after today's discussion is a deeper understanding of what the target product profile is and how it can optimize the drug product development process, how to build and maintain a target product profile in different drug development phases, and how to use the information gathered in a target product profile to identify next steps and to speed the product to market. So, First and foremost, what is the target product profile and why is it essential in the development pipeline? 
Well, oftentimes formulation development projects don't really have a very well-defined block of work. So therefore a drug development team will use the TPP to gather information about the desired characteristics of a product and align on overall project goals. So specifically the TPP concisely captures the key attributes of the product and identifies gaps in current knowledge to highlight development priorities. And by doing these two things, the TPP will provide a roadmap to guide development towards project goals. So by, you can see by beginning with the end goals in mind, the TPP identifies clear objectives for development of an effective and efficient research plan, which will optimize the likelihood of your product's success. It is also important to point out that the TPP is a living document that changes over time and should be revised and revisited regularly as the development team executes the research plan. So now that we know what a target product profile is and why it's important, which individuals should be involved in the TPP development discussion? So let's meet the drug development team. So these are individuals that come from multiple groups that will provide input from their specific area of expertise during the TPP development proce um, process. So one of the groups is discovery and they will provide input about the molecule and will also need to understand the target mechanism of action. Another group are clinical and medical. So these are usually MDs or medical professionals that provide input about issues with current treatments and can identify gaps in treatments available. And then there's the marketing group. They'll provide input about gaps in the treatment market. So for example, if there is a current treatment that is QID or four times daily dosing that has low patient compliance, it may be profitable to develop a BID twice daily or QD once daily dosage form. So the regulatory group will provide input about the needs to meet requirements for different climatic zones, meaning uh, the regulations in locations that the product is approved may have different requirements. And finally, the CMC group or the chemistry manufacturing and controls group will provide input on how to feasibly manufacture the drug product. So now that we know what the target product profile is and who should be involved in the process, what does the TPP look like? So the TPP format typically has three columns. The first column is the product attribute or the product characteristic that needs to be defined. The second is the must required minimum column, which is the requirement for that attribute that must be met. And the third is the wants preferred desired column, and that, that would be the desired criteria that would be preferable for that attribute. So for example, an attribute can be something like patient population or the maximum dosage form size and the information that you would fill in in the must want columns could be human adult patients for the must and wants for the patient population attribute and size double zero capsules and size one capsule or smaller in the must and want column for the maximum dosage form size attribute. So as you can see from this example, sometimes the specifications for the must and want columns will be the same or sometimes they can be different. So now that we have defined what a target product profile looks like and who should be a part of the conversation, now how do we start to build the preliminary target product profile? So I'm going to share the process that we use at Freethink to build a TPP with our clients. Uh, and I'll first start off with going over some of the key sections to consider. So one section to consider our indications and usage. And in this section, we might ask questions like, what disease slash condition is targeted? 
who are the target patients? So are they adult pa patients or pediatric patients? And where is the target market? So where is the product being approved? Is it in one country or is it globally? And which zone is this uh, country in? In the next session, dosage and administration, we may ask questions like, how is the dosage form administered? So is it administered orally, through IV, and where is it administered? Is it at home or in the hospital? So what is the dosage strength, but also how many strengths are needed? Uh, another question, what is the duration of the treatment? So is it for chronic or acute treatment? And what should the dosage form look like? So are there any size requirements or formulation component requirements that should be considered? In the next section, pharmacokinetics, we may ask questions like, what is the mechanism of action? What are the pharmacokinetic requirements? So are there any C-min or C-max considerations? And how and where is the drug absorbed? So is there any difference when, do when the drug is dosed in a fed or fasted state? And if there is, is there a preference or requirement to dose without regard to food? And finally, we might consider the final product considerations. So things like, what are the stability requirements? And often stability requirements will differ for each of the climatic zones. Uh, what are the packaging requirements? So we can think about packaging in with respect to stability, but we may also need to think about packaging in regards to what the patient population is. And finally, um, are there any requirements for the manufacturing process? So do excipients used in the formulation need to be precedented within pharma? Are new excipients acceptable? Or is there a particular process, equipment, or manufacturing location that needs to be used? So while we can see that the TPP is divided into general sections, uh, the particular questions that you'll need to ask yourself um, to fill out the TPP are specific to the drug development phase. So the first steps to build a preliminary target product profile are to determine the phase of drug product development and define the primary project objective for that phase. So let's talk about what the development phases are and what the primary project goals are for each of these drug phases. So the first category is a new product or a new chemical entity in which there is no previous approval. So the primary objective for these types of projects would be to determine what is marketable or approvable. The second would be to develop a product to match an existing product, which is otherwise known as a generic. And the primary objective for these type of projects is to determine, demonstrate bioequivalence. Um, and the third type uh, is to develop a product to improve upon an existing product. So the primary objective for these types of projects would be to determine what needs to be improved and how do we go about improving it? So let's now walk through a few examples of how to develop a target product profile for each of these phases. So in the instance of a new chemical entity, or NCE, remember that the major objective is to determine what is approvable and marketable. So therefore, we should consider questions like the patient population. So is the product for humans or animals? And the development pipeline will look different for each of these. So what is the target market? So does the target market include countries in different climatic zones? And think about how will the requirements change for each zone? Uh, so what is the treatment duration? Again, is this for acute or chronic? And then where is the administration location? So will this be dosed by a medical professional or will this be dosed at home? 
And again, there can be different requirements for someone that needs to take the medication at home versus having it dosed by a trained medical professional. So I'll give you a minute to absorb these questions, but keep them in mind as I go over a partial example of a TPP for an NCE next. So in this example, let's consider a new chemical entity for which there is no previous approval. And so in discussion with the drug development team, we find that there is a promising molecule that can treat a chronic disease in both adult and pediatric patients. Um, and it was indicated by both the medical and marketing team that developing a product to treat this condition would be beneficial to patients. Uh, the team would also like to approve this product globally in the US, EU, and Japanese markets. And in speaking with the discovery group, they've identified that the appropriate route of an administration is orally, and that this particular molecule has a long enough half-life for a twice daily immediate release product. So let's take a look at the TPP. So if we look at the patient population attribute, we can see here that we must at least develop a product for human adult patients. However, we know that this is a this chronic disease affects pediatric patients as well. So it would be beneficial to have a product that works for that population. And in some instances, another motivation would be that for some new chemical entities, there may also be legislation that could require development of a pediatric product or at least a pediatric plan in parallel to the adult product. So for the number of formulations attribute, we see that we must at least target development of two formulations, but it would be preferable to develop four formulations for motivations such as increased dosing flexibility. And in discussion with the uh, development team, they would also like to develop a low and a high dosage form. So in the formulation strengths attributes, we can see a desire to develop a 15 and 30 milligram dose for adults and a one to five milligram dose for pediatrics. Um, here for the dosing frequency attribute, we may discuss having the desire for a once daily product for patient compliance. Um, but if this is not feasible, then we must at least develop a twice daily dose product. So now, as we identified before, we want to develop a product for pediatric patients. So we must now consider what types of dosage forms and packaging are appropriate for that target population. So for example, an adult patient can swallow better than a pediatric patient. So in the type of formulation attribute, a solid dosage form like a tablet or capsule is appropriate. However, pediatric patients, um, would need a liquid formulation for swallowability. And again, for maximum dosage form size, we must consider what is appropriate for the pa patient population here. So we've chosen a size double zero capsule for the adult patient, but would like to develop a three milliliter volume dosage for the pediatric patients. And finally, if we look at the formulation packaging section, blister packaging is appropriate for adult patients, but a bottle with a childproof lock and a dosing spoon would be more appropriate for the pediatric patients. Now, you may also have different motivations for developing a tablet or a capsule. So for example, tablets generally can achieve a higher um, a higher drug loading and have more shape variety for marketing. And however, in some cases, capsule formulations can be faster to, to clinic and capsules could provide better stability in some cases. So as we built this TPP, you may have noticed there are some clear areas in which more information is needed and that these answers must be found through experimentation. 
So for this product, the most obvious question would be, can a liquid formulation be developed? And therefore, the research plan that follows development of the TPP um, would need to consider if we can make an oral liquid formulation that can be developed with a reasonable quantity to dose. Some other considerations that we may think about for liquid formulation are things like, does the product need taste masking or a particular mouthfeel for the patient population? Or is this drug poorly soluble? And if so, what challenges would this bring to the project? Um, and if you would like to know more about this particular uh, item, we actually have a webinar coming up in our series that talks more specifically about processes to improve drug solubilization that'll be given by Ken. Um, so other gaps that were identified while we were talking about the example are things like, can, a, um, can we feasibly formulate a solid dosage formulation? Um, can we feasibly make a high dose formulation? Okay. So next, um, let's take a look at how to build a target product profile for a generic product and the key differences in strategies between how you might build a TPP for a generic product versus a TPP for a new chemical entity. So generally, many of the questions that we might have considered before when building the TPP for the new chemical entity will have, uh, will have answers that are more defined. So for example, in the generic phase of development, the patient population or the target market are most, are most likely already established. So for generic products, it will be important to consider what requirements, what the requirements are for the generic product in relation to the reference product to prove bioequivalence. Because remember, the primary goal for these projects is to demonstrate bioequivalence. And the major question here will then be, what degree of bioequivalence is needed? Um, and this degree will relate to the clinical program that the development team would like to run uh, and the biopharmaceutical or BCS class of the drug. Um, so keep these considerations in mind as we go through a partial example of a TPP for a generic product. So in this example, the reference product is already approved in Brazil for human adult patients. The reference product is an extended release dosage form taken twice a day. Um, and so then remember for the generic product, the main goal is to prove bioequivalence or match the reference product. So therefore, as you take a look at this TPP, most of the attributes have the same criteria listed in the must and want columns. And attributes where there are differences will depend on the motivations of the development team. So in this example, one of the differences in the dosage form is the dosage form release profile criteria. So here we should consider if there is already an established dissolution method for the reference product. Um, and if there is, then we need to understand um, the difference between, uh, then we would need to establish whether or not we need to be similar or equivalent to this profile. Another difference here is found in the type of formulation requirements. Uh, so the development team would like to film coat the tablet. And if film coating is desired, then we need to consider how do we formulate the film coating. And we might also want to consider if this dosage form needs a functional coating. So for example, an enteric coating, or is this coating purely for appearance purposes? 
Um, the team also prefers to develop a low and high dosage form so that they could decrease the number of tablets per dose, as in they would like to dose two 200 milligram tablets instead of four 100 milligram tablets or have the option to do so. So this desire is listed in the formulation strengths attribute. And the product must be manufactured with a process and equipment that is commercially available and precedented in pharma. But in speaking with the drug development team, they would prefer to use equipment that they may already have at their facility. And they've also specified that they would like to use direct compression as it is simple as it is simpler process and uses less equipment. So for the stability and storage of the formulation requirement, it's important to keep in mind what country the product will be approved in. So in this case, Brazil has special zone requirements that would inform what the stability requirement should be for the product. And again, as we built this EPP, we see that there are a couple of areas that need to be addressed. So first, what should the com formulation components be? So most likely the product would contain similar excipients to the reference product, but there could be some excipients in the reference product that the drug development team may want to avoid. Um, the second would be what should the formulation composition look like to achieve the desired release profile? And we'll discuss strategies to develop controlled release formulations in our future webinar that Sherry will give. So stay tuned for that. So these considerations and other considerations that we identified in the example, like film coating, use of direct compression, and feasibility of high dose, and stability requirements should also be addressed in the research plan that follows development of this TPP. So finally, to build a TPP for a product that wishes to improve upon an existing product, that we must consider what needs to be improved and the motivations behind this improvement. So for example, would the motivation be to decrease side effects that are seen in the existing product? Or maybe it could be to improve patient compliance by decreasing the dosing frequency. Other considerations when developing this type of TPP would be to think about if there are any known limitations based on the existing drug product. So for example, is there an established therapeutic window are there any CMAX specifications, meaning is there a plasma concentration above which side effects are observed? Or are there CMIN specifications, meaning is there a minimum concentration needed to remain efficacious? So keep these ideas in mind as we go through the partial TPP for an improvement on an existing product. So let's consider a case in which there are two existing approved products, let's call them drug A and drug B, that must be administered in conjunction with each other. So input from the medical team has found that while the medication works well to treat the specific condition, it is difficult to co-administer. So therefore, it would be beneficial to combine drug A and drug B into a single fixed dose combination for ease of co-administration. So here in the number of formulations and formulation concentrations attributes, we can see the team would like to develop two fixed dose concentrations, one at a lower dose of one milligram drug A to one milligram drug B, and one at a higher dose of five milligrams drug A to five milligrams drug B. Then to prove feasibility here, we would need to determine if that higher drug, higher dosage can feasibly fit into the required dosing volume of 300 microliters. So in speaking with the team, 
they also indicated that it's preferable to make a preservative free formulation since development is simpler and requires fewer components. So this desire is put into the preservatives attribute section. However, it is more difficult for liquids to meet stability requirements for longer periods of time without preservative. And now here in the stability and storage formulation attribute, we can see that there is a wide range in specifications between the must and the want column. So the need is for the product to be stable for two years under refrigeration and stable for one month at room temperature, whereas the desire is for 10 years stability at room temperature. And this wide gap allows room for discussion on what requirements are preferable in the event that generated stability data shows the drug product can be stable somewhere between the must and want columns, or even if there are multiple acceptable stability conditions. Um, and finally, for ease of administration, it is preferable to develop a formulation that is in packaging that contains the exact dosing volume, but to progress, we would need to consider the injectability of the formulation. And again, we see that developing the TPP has identified gaps that need to be addressed. Um, so one of the considerations would be, do drug A and drug B interact with each other in a way that could affect the stability of the dosage form? And if they do, what challenges does this bring to formulation development? Um, and so I won't touch too much on this subject as we will discuss more in the webinar given by Maria, which is all about uh, formulating for stability. So other considerations that we talked about was um, feasibility of high dose forms, the feasibility of a preservative free formulation, whether the considerations for the injectability of the formulations, and then considerations for the product stability and packaging. So all of these would need to be addressed in the research plan that follows the development of this TPP. So now that we've learned how to develop a preliminary target product profile, what are the next steps and what do you do with the information gathered in the TPP? So as you saw in the examples, the TPP identified gaps in current knowledge. And so by clearly identifying these gaps, we can now easily pinpoint what needs to happen next to address these gaps. So therefore, we will create a research plan that includes experiments geared towards addressing project challenges that were identified in the TPP and meeting the critical project attributes defined in the TPP. And recall again that the TPP is a living document and should be revised and revisited frequently as new information is received. So let's, con let's consider a case study so we can see how the TPP is used in a real life scenario. So in this case, compound X is already approved as an immediate release IR dosage form for twice daily BI dose, BID dosing in human adult patients. So here, if you recall from our discussion earlier about drug development phases, we can tell that the project for a new compound X product um, would be to improve upon the existing immediate release version of compound X. And so remember that the major objectives for these types of projects is to determine what needs to be improved. In this case, it is the release profile. Um, so here, our goal is for this product is to develop a once daily QD extended release ER oral product. And the motivations behind this improvement is to reduce the dosing frequency for patient compliance and to blunt the CMAX to decrease side effects. So let's take a look at the preliminary TPP that we built for compound X. Um, so let me grab my laser pointer. 
Um, so we can see an attribute for our patient population. Uh, we would like to dose into human adult patients. The target market is globally. The route of administration is oral. The dosing frequency, we would like to dose at least a once daily QD product, and we need this to be an extended release product. And for the PK um, parameters, we want to blunt the Cmax. So we want the Cmax to be less than the Cmax of the immediate release tablet. But as you can see here in the dosage form release profile, as we don't have a lot of information about um, extended the extended release profile, we don't have any information to put into these columns. And that sometimes happens when you develop a TPP, and that's totally OK. So as you can see here, then our major, our next step is to determine what the release profile should be. Let me turn off my laser pointer. OK, so as you saw, the TPP identified the need to understand if compound X has absorption in the gastrointestinal tract, as if you're moving from an IR dosage, uh, immediate release dosage form to an extended release dosage form, um, absorption will shift further down the GI tract into either the small or the lower intestine. And so we don't have any data um, to understand this yet. So. To, um, to understand the absorption in the GI tract, we developed an oral extended release ER osmotic capsule osmocap dosage form, and we dosed into dogs to evaluate the ER absorption in vivo. Um, so what is osmocap? So osmocap is free things proprietary oral extended release osmotic capsule. Um, so Osmocap is an extended, uh, releases drug over an extended period and not, so it's not enteric or delayed release. And also offers a range of drug release profiles that are determined not by the API characteristics, but are controlled by the capsule shell formulation. So this means that the release is independent of drug properties, pH and position in the GI tract. So this means that Osmocap um, has an advantage over other technologies like matrix tablets that can be more affected by drug properties. Uh, Osmocap also has fast development times. So Osmocap uses the capsule technology compared to an osmotic tablet technology, which is a bilayer coated tablet, which might may have more complex um, equipment for manufacture and also may take a longer time for manufacture. And you can see that by combining PK sampling with imaging, uh, Osmocap can directly correlate the drug absorption with the position in the GI tract. So if you take a look at our picture is here, we can see Osmocap um, in a dog. So what does the Osmocap release mechanism look like? So an Osmocap is made out of two capsule shells, and one of the capsule shells has a hole to allow for drug to come out. Um, so when an osmocap enters the GI tract, water is osmotically drawn into the shell uh, in, um, at a rate that is determined by the capsule shell permeability. And the active and push layers that are inside the capsule shell as water comes in uh, will start to solubilize. And so a combination of pressure buildup and the push layer swelling uh, will deliver the drug out of the hole as a viscous, viscous solution or suspension in a predictable zero order release rate that is independent of the drug solubility. So when formulating for an osmocap dosage form, 
um, we can formulate for solid API or drug product intermediate that will be processed into the active layer. And our current dosage range is between one to 150 milligrams. Uh, once we make the active and push layers, we can fill them into the capsule shells. Then the capsule shells will be sealed and ready to dose. So currently, Osmo cap capsule shells are size double zero. And we have two formulations, formulation A, which is 80% API released in six hours, and formulation B, which targets 80% API released in 14 hours. Um, and so for this project for Compound X, both formulation A and formulation B were dosed to dogs. So if we take a look at the um, PK data here, and we take a look at the graph with time on the x-axis and plasma concentration on the y-axis, we can see that the Tmax for the immediate release dosage form had a four-hour Tmax, and this is for reference. And we can see that the formulation A osmocap extended the absorption and shifted that Tmax to the 12-hour time point. And so from this information, we can say that um, there is sufficient enough absorption to go forward with an extended release formulation. Um, and also in data not shown here, formulation B was also dosed into dogs and found that there was little to no absorption in the lower GI tract. So with this information, we can tell that we, sh we should develop an extended release dosage form with release durations that are based on upper GI absorption. So how does this experimental data affect the target product profile? Well, in the results from the, well, the results from the dog study prove that an extended release was feasible. So we can use the data generated from that study to specifically fill in the release rate targets in the dosage form release profile or the dosage form release profile attribute. So as a result of this, a once daily extended release dosage form can be developed for advancement into clinical trials. So as you can see that by leveraging the TPP, we were able to easily pinpoint the most important questions to address, uh, so i.e. the need to understand absorption throughout the gastrointestinal tract. And as a result, we made an efficient research plan uh, using OSMOCAP as a tool to quickly assess extended release feasibility so a fully formulated drug product could advance down the pipeline to clinical trials. So in summary, I hope you have learned how to develop a target product profile, um, specifically how to identify the different drug development phases and their primary project objectives, and then use that information to ask the right questions to define critical project goals and product, product attributes when building a TPP. Um, and additionally, I hope we learned how the TPP can pinpoint gaps in current knowledge that allow the development team to produce a research plan with clear objectives to address the information gaps and drive research towards project goals. Finally, I hope you have learned why continually updating the target product profile throughout development stages is important to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of your research to speed the product to market, as we discussed in our OSMOCAP case study. Um, so thank you again to everyone for listening in. And I will welcome any questions now. Jessica, thank you for the presentation. Um, it does look like we have some time for questions. Um, so if folks have questions, feel free to fill that into the Q&A box. Um, we'll get to as many as we can, and we'll try to address um, those that we don't get to um, offline. So uh, feel free to, to put that in. Um, so I'll start with... Um, so Jessica, there's a question on how is the TPP that you presented different from a QTPP? 
Okay, that, that's a great question. Um, so the ICH has uh, certain guidelines about the different types of TPPs, and one of them is the quality target product profile, or the QTPP. And generally, the QTPP is developed by the CMC group after development of the overall um, project target product profile. And the QTPP will generally have attributes that are more specific to the dosage form. So you can consider these like a precursor to the um, certificate of analysis. So things that will be on the QTPP will be things like dosage, um, dosage form strength um, or assay requirements. So uh, what we do when we build the TPP at FreeThink is bridge that overall target product profile with the more specific quality target product profile. So as you see, there were attributes of a more, more higher level product attributes and then um, attributes that are more specific to the dosage form size. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Thanks. Um, and there's a question on, can TPPs be used for um, products other than uh, drugs, so such as a drug device combination? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question again? Oh, sure. Um, the question is about um, sort of broader use of the TPPs. So can that be used like for drug device combinations? Sure. Another good question. Uh, so yes, uh, TPPs can be used for other things uh, like um, like drug devices. So you would use similar concepts as we discussed in when we develop TPPs for drug products. Um, but you might ask more. We might ask different types of questions that are more specific to that drug device. Um, and if you'd like to discuss more, we can. Um, about those specific questions we can discuss offline. You can contact me. Sounds good. Um, there's a question. I think you talked about some of the um, drug product manufacturing options. Um, and so what is direct compression and why might it be preferred over other options? Sure. Um, so direct compression is a manufacturing process used in tablet manufacturing. It's actually one of a few different types. So direct compression is when you take the um, active pharmaceutical ingredient, ingredient and blend with the excipients. And then you can directly take that blend and um, manufacture tablets. Uh, so the, one of the advantages of this method is that it's... Um, simpler and faster and uses less equipments. Um, but one of the pitfalls can be if there are differences in um, particle size of your API or even your excipients, you may have issues with um, segregation of your blend, um, but you may also have issues with uh, flowability. Um, so to address these issues, they might use manufacturing techniques like um, dry granulation or um, wet granulation, which may provide um, better homogeneity in your blend. Uh, but those also have some pitfalls. So like the uh, dry granulation, um, when you use maybe like a, a roller compactor to um, compress uh, to partially compress your API with um, with excipients first and then go through another milling step afterwards um, that may help with homogeneity of your blend, but then it's also kind of increasing the complexity of your process. And in wet granulation, uh, you may use um, you may use different solvents to to granulate, uh, but then adding adding that solvent could add its own complexities. So really choosing which technology you might use will kind of depend on um, the requirements for that product. Okay. Um, and it sounds like a somewhat related question. Um, is inclusion of a surfactant permissible um, in the formulation um, where the drug product has, uh, or the drug substance has high solubility characteristics um, for an oral dosage form intended for immediate release. Um, I said, can you can you repeat the question again? Sure. Um, it's asking about um, 
inclusion, evaluate inclusion of a surfactant um, when the API has um, some solubility characteristics um, for an oral dosage form intended for immediate release. Sounds um, like more of a formulation type question in terms of formulating, and that might be. Um... Yeah, so I think in that case, it, it, you you probably would want to um, develop some some type of research plan to evaluate whether or not you can include the surfactants um, in in that formulation. So you'd probably have to do a little bit of research there. Um, so let's see, um, how quickly can an osmocap dosage form be developed for animal testing? Um, so, so typically, good question. Typically, uh, the, um, the timeline for manufacturing of an osmocap dosage form is, um, about eight weeks. Uh, from the time of receipt of material uh, to send to the um, the te uh, animal testing site. Okay. Um, and can osmocap be dosed into humans? Good question. So currently we are dosing into animals, but we are currently um, developing uh, the manufacturing process and transferring to a GMP facility um, to manufacture capsules to dose into humans for clinical trials. Um, and this should hopefully be ready some sometime by the early next year. Okay. Um, another question, how do physical pharmacy measurements play a role in the TPP? Um, physical pharmacy measurements. Um, I have to think about that. So physical pharmacy measurements, meaning things like hardness and variability type of questions or yeah, I mean, I let's start with there. They're not more specific than that. So I think that sounds a reasonable kind of place to start. Yeah. Um, so I think it would be a discussion with the client based on what their requirements are. So, and kind of the reasons why you might need these pharmacy um, measurements. And um, if OsmoCap is a research device, how translatable are the results from the animal study into designing the ER tablet? Uh, so one of the um, one of the advantages of OsmoCap is that it has good in in vitro in vivo correlation. Um, so because so because of, of the release mechanism, it, the um, data from OsmoCap could be very translatable, um, could be very translatable to an extent, the final formulation of the extended release product. Great. Um, so another question, um, sometimes things aren't possible. Can the TPP be used to set some boundaries, such as maximum absorbable dose? Yes. Um, I think that would be kind of, again, uh, discussions with the client when we're building the TPP and so kind of establishing what should those boundaries be and why do you need those boundaries? That's good. And let's see, um, how high of a dose can you put into an OsmoCap? Uh, currently right now, the maximum dose for an OsmoCap is uh, 150 milligrams. Okay, great. 
think we're almost out of time. Um, so probably that will wrap up at, at this point. Um, thank you, Jessica, for, um, for reading the presentation. Um, just a reminder to folks that uh, we that we'll have this recording on the Freethink website. So if you want to access this or have anyone else access it, you can go to our website and find that. Um, and please join us for next week. Um, we will have Ken Waterman presenting on solubilization selection. Thank you all. Thank you.